Even now, there is something about seeing the future queen in uniform, doing ordinary war duty as a mechanic in the army. Without a word, she seems to say, we're all in this together. It's a theme that often comes up, even when, like other British brides during and after the war, she married in a dress made from material bought with rationed clothing coupons and publicly declared to be free from the work of Japanese or enemy silkworms. It was early that the Queen's clothes made far more than fashion statements. The coronation dress, for example, embroidered with the emblems of the UK and of every dominion in the Commonwealth. Since then, far from frivolous curiosity, her clothes, like the Queen herself, even deployed as a subtle weapon in forging ties abroad, especially early on. It was a context in which British power was rapidly declining, and in a sense they had a sort of young, quite glamorous monarch, and I think they realised that this was something that could project Britishness and British power in a way that Britain couldn't really do so itself. Without actual political power, her presence mattered, and in such a visual role, glamorous clothes were the required uniform. But the soft diplomacy the Foreign Office expected post-war demanded more. Designers literally weaving in the flattery, stitching together nuanced but unmistakable messaging, meticulously planned and aimed at the Queen's foreign hosts. Just to give you a small sense of the thinking that goes behind some of these messages, take a look at this. It's the highest order of chivalry in Thailand, presented to the Queen by the King of Thailand back in 1960. Twelve years later, she wore it on a state visit with a dress made to match by longtime royal designer Norman Hartnell. And in one subtle message, she managed to say more than in any speech. There is a long line of examples. How flattered China's leader Deng Xiaoping must have been when the Queen wore a dress adorned with China's national flower on the first ever trip by a British monarch at the height of the Cold War. And California was charmed in 1983 by the Queen's colorful compliment, almost as important as her verbal thanks to the US for helping in the Falkland Islands War a year earlier. And the dress is embroidered in beautiful detail with Californian poppies, which are the, the flower of the state of California. In Canada, 1957, it was the Maple Leaf of Canada dress, a deft diplomatic creation also by Norman Hartnell that the Queen wore during a state banquet in Ottawa. It worked like a charm. The emerald encrusted leaves won her big headlines, despite a major flood in Spain and the Nobel Peace Prize given to Lester B. Pearson for his own diplomatic efforts in the Suez Crisis. In her 21 other visits to Canada, there was the floral nod to Nova Scotia. And the maple leaf was always there. One brooch even later lent to Kate when she visited. It was in Canada. The Queen's clothes once made the wrong kind of headlines. In 1984, the first time she visited after the Constitution was patriated, unimpressed with her clothing, a Toronto paper called her dowdy, Another said she looked tired, that her legs had visible veins. It unleashed a Canada thrashing in the British tabloids, and the palace was not amused. And the back and forth sniping tinged the visit, says this academic who's researched the Queen's diplomatic dressing. And it was interesting that the notion that talking negatively about what the Queen was wearing could damage the state visit itself. So I think that's also a sign of the power of what the Queen was wearing, and probably a rare occasion of where there was negative comment about what she was wearing. Being a woman is an advantage in such a role. So much more to say with gowns than with suits. But like other women in the public sphere, her appearance does get far more attention than a man's does in a similar role. She also had to skirt traditions more carefully, 
in the Middle East and in Turkey. And though a queen only wears black for mourning, she did it in a veil to see the Pope, as papal protocol dictates, while she, the head of the Church of England, helped smooth relations with the Vatican. Though in a diplomatic win of his own, the current Pope Francis waived the requirement when her tight schedule didn't allow her time to change. One British columnist called it a surprise win for women. She said, oh, no, no, he said, tell her to come as she is, I just want to see her. So, you know, the Queen turned up and they got on like a house on fire. Of all the color-driven diplomatic overtures, none quite matched the effect of the emerald green she wore in a show of reconciliation when she landed in Ireland in 2011. A visit many thought would never happen, given the troubled history. But the trip and the outfits were a huge success, says this longtime royal photographer. And she had a bodice of this dress made out of 2,000 silk shamrocks and she had an Irish harp diamond brooch. And the reception she got was fantastic, and, uh, and none more so than by the president of Ireland when she at the state banquet and uh, welcomed the Queen, and the Queen, in her reply, uh, the first words in Irish. And they all just went crazy. The whole crowd went crazy. I promise you, I've never been so moved in my life. With a trusted team involved, there were few missteps in the 63 years' worth of a working wardrobe. One that the Queen helped shape herself, says this former advisor. What would go to her would be an initial plan of, this is what we're thinking of, of doing to check to see whether she's comfortable with that, and then she would be involved at every stage. As much thinking still goes into what she wears at home, especially in Scotland. Events like the opening of the Parliament there in 1999. It was a new, modern Parliament, so we wanted something that reflected that. We wanted to have a Scottish feel to it. The outfit was designed by Sandra Murray. The result was this with just a hint of the tartan that the royals long ago adopted as an inclusive gesture. Now on display at her palace in Edinburgh, the dresses, even without the Queen, are on a diplomatic mission of their own. So the coat, as you see, is this beautiful purple colour, referencing the purple heather of the, of the landscape. The most travelled monarch in history is, at 90, now staying closer to home. Her working clothes are much more like a uniform, simpler, more consistent, and often bright, to make sure the home crowds can spot her. On the eve of her 90th birthday, she posed for a portrait that seemed to depict all that she is, a queen, an ambassador, and still a working woman. Nala Ayed, CBC News, London.